بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ایم ڈاکٹر نور محمد شیخ پروفیسر ڈپارٹمنٹ آف الیکٹریکل انجینئرنگ یونیورسٹی آف انجینئرنگ اینڈ ٹیکنالوجی لاہور ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ وتھ اے نیو کورس آن کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر دی کورس مٹیریل ہیز بین پرائمیرلی پریپیئرڈ بائی ڈاکٹر انجم علی ہو از اے پروفیسر ایٹ الخوارزمی انسٹیٹیوٹ آف کمپیوٹر سائنس ایٹ یونیورسٹی آف انجینئرنگ اینڈ ٹیکنالوجی لاہور ٹوڈے ان دی فرسٹ لیکچر ول اسٹارٹ وتھ سم فنڈامنٹلز آف کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر ول جسٹ ٹرائی ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ واٹ کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر از اینڈ دین سم جنرلائز نوشنز and gradually we'll go to more complex notions and try to understand more insight into the different parts and different subsystems of a computer let us now look at a few slides by now you know that how a digital computer operates a computer operates under the control of instructions stored in its own memory unit that can accept data as an input process this data arithmetically and or logically produce output from the processing and then store the results for any future use the generalized block diagram is shown in this slide as you know there are three major parts of any computer a memory arithmetic logic unit and control the input and output are connected to this main block within this subsystem the connection between different units is through different buses the main buses are data bus address bus and control bus you see in the block diagram for the generalized computer the cpu the central processing unit is connected to the address bus control bus and the data bus similarly the memory contents could be accessed through these address buses or data bus the input output connects the peripherals to the main computer what is computer architecture architecture generally could be considered as an art or science of building or it could be interpreted as a style and method of design and construction the term computer architecture was coined at IBM in 60s it was used to refer to the programmer visible portion of the instruction set of the IBM 360 family of computers the structure of a computer that a machine language programmer must understand to write correct programs for the machine to be visible and to be operative there is usually a confusion between the two terms computer architecture and computer organization computer architecture usually refers to those attributes of a computer which tell us how to design a computer like set instruction set how the memory would be organized how would be the interconnection between the memory and different buses whereas the computer organization usually refers to the operational features of a computer for example what particular instructions should be there in a set of computer instruction that belongs to computer architecture whereas how these computer instructions would be implemented this is a feature belonging to computer organization let us now look at a few more slides 
related to the computer architecture. Now let us see who is a computer architect. The answer to this question is that computer architect is a person who designs computers. What do we mean by design? Design is the process of devising a system, component or process to meet desired needs. What is meant by design? It's a decision making process and usually it is iterative in which the basic sciences and mathematics and engineering sciences are applied to convert resources optimally to meet a stated objective. There is a very close analogy between automobiles and computers. There are people who know how to drive a car and similarly there are people who know how to operate a computer. These are computer users. The computer users just are interested in an efficient use of the computer. Similarly, there are people who could repair automobiles. These are technicians. Exactly in the same way, there are people who could repair computers. These are computer technicians. Finally, there are very few people in the world who could really design new cars. These are the automobile designers. Exactly in the same way, there are very few people who could really design and invent new computers. And these are exactly the people who are the computer architects. We are going to learn how to design computers in this course. However, before we can understand how to design, we should know some of the existing designs for different computers. This will look into this course as we go through this course. Before the design of any computer, an abstraction usually helps in the design. We are going to look at a few abstractions now. Let us see some of the slides on abstraction. The abstraction could be looked at from three angles. From system point of view, from logic design point of view, and circuit point of view. From system design point of view, there are three abstractions which are usually used. The first abstraction usually called processor memory switch level abstraction looks into system components and their interconnections. The components are specified in this abstraction in the form of a block diagram. The processor includes the data path as well as the control. The second system level abstraction is the instruction set level. The function of each instruction is defined in this abstraction. The emphasis is on the behavior of the system rather than the hardware structure of the system. The third system design abstraction is the register transfer level. This is the hardware abstraction. Hardware structure is more visible in this abstraction. The basic elements indicated in the abstraction are the registers. The second abstraction is the logic design abstraction. This is also called gate level abstraction. We use gates and flip-flops. The behavior in this case is less visible while the hardware structure dominates. The next abstraction is the circuit design abstraction. Circuit design abstraction emphasizes and gives a visibility to resistors, transistors, capacitors, 
diodes and other components. Finally, the lowest level of abstraction is the mask level. This shows the silicon structure of the chip. The layout and its implementation is given in integrated circuit design. In this abstraction, the layout design is useful for final fabrication. However, the system design is most commonly used by a computer architect. On successful completion of this course, a student is supposed to understand the different points of view of studying computer architecture. In particular, the instruction set abstraction and the register level abstraction should be very clearly understood. Secondly, the student is supposed to know the combinational and sequential circuits and should be able to design more complex structures of ALU arithmetic logic unit by using combinational and sequential circuits. Finally, the different memory structures should also be visible and a student should be able to understand the organization and utilization of different memory structures. The course outline which we are going to follow would be starting with a very simple computer organization, then computer architecture, and then we will develop a very simple example of a simplified processor for understanding the different notions of computer architecture. The next slide would show which textbook and which reference book uh, books we are going to use for this particular course. The textbook for this course is Computer Systems Design and Architecture by V.P. Hoyring and H.F. Jordan. It was published in 1997. There are other two excellent reference books. Computer Architecture, A Qualitative Approach. This is the second edition by Patterson and it's a 1996 edition. Computer Organization and Architecture by William Stallings is also an excellent book and sixth edition is available and is published by Prentice Hall. Now from these textbooks and the reference books, a student would be able to understand very clearly computer organization, computer architecture, the design of ESA bus, other examples of different processors, design of CPU and advanced topics in processor design, the interfacing with input and output and implementation of arithmetic logic unit and finally the memory subsystems. Let us now look at different modules which we have designed for this particular course. Altogether, there would be 11 modules for this course. The first module would cover up the computer organization and architecture design. It would also cover different levels of abstraction in digital system design and an introduction to different topics to be followed in following modules would be discussed. Second module would discuss in detail the computer organization. In organization, the different perspectives of different people about computers would be discussed. In particular, we would see the point of view of users, the point of view of designers, and the point of view of final evaluation of the organization. 
general operation of a stored program digital computer would be discussed. The concept of fetch execute process would be discussed and finally the concept of ISA would be looked into. The third module would discuss foundations of computer architecture, a taxonomy of computers and their instruction set would be discussed in detail. The instruction set features of some example processors would be discussed. Different addressing modes of the processors would be discussed with specific examples. The reduced instruction and the complex instruction architectures that is the RISC and CISC architectures would be discussed in detail. Finally, the measures of performance would be looked into. The next module 4 would develop an example processor, introduction to the ISA and instruction formats would be given. Coding examples with hand assembly would be taken up. Using RTL, we will describe a simple example processor SRC. The implementation with register, transfer logic and digital logic circuits would be taken. Module 5 would discuss the design and development of ISA. Outline of the thinking process for ISA design would be taken up. We will introduce the ISA concept of a typical example called Falcon A. We will also take up the learning aids for this example as Falcon A. Module 6 would take another example processor Falcon E followed by Eagle and modified Eagle. Finally, in this module, we will make a comparison of all these four ISAs. Module 7 would take up the important feature of CPU design, which is a core of computer architecture course. A unibus data path implementation for the SRC would be taken up. Structural RTL descriptions for the SRC instructions would be looked into. We will discuss logic design for the Unibus SRC. We will also see how the control unit would be developed. The 2 and 3 bus processor implementations would also be looked in more detail. The machine reset process would be taken up and explained and some of the machine exceptions would be analyzed. Module 8 would discuss some of the advanced topics in processor design like pipelining, instruction level parallelism and finally the microprogramming. Module 9 would take up the 
I.O. interfacing. We will see how the I.O. interface design could be implemented. We will see the programmed I.O. concept and also the interrupt driven I.O. concept and finally the process of direct memory access the DMA would be analyzed. Module 10 would take up the implementation of arithmetic logic shift unit. Examples with addition, subtraction, multiplication and division both for integer implementation and floating point implementation would be taken up. The last module 11 would discuss different memory subsystems. We will look into the general organization of memory, the hierarchy of the memory, the cache memory and the final virtual memory organization. With that our course would be finalized and hopefully we will uh, learn the most important concepts of the computer architecture. We have observed that a computer architect is a person who has to design computers. He has to optimize all the resources available to him for appropriate and efficient design he needs to understand the perception of computers by different people. There could be different perceptions. Let us look at four different perceptions. Number one, the perception by a user of the computer, the view by a programmer of the computer, and the view by an architect of a computer and finally the logic designer of a computer. All these perceptions would finally help an architect, a computer architect to better design a computer. Let us look into these perceptions in a little bit more detail. Now we look first at how the user perceives the computer. Let us see at the slide. A user is a person employing the computer to do useful work. Useful work is quite a relative term. For, a, for an office assistant, the useful work could be in the form of using a spreadsheet or a word processor or a user could develop programs in higher level language. For an engineering student, the computer could be used in the form of a CAD CAM device. In all cases, however, one thing is quite clear. For the user, the internal structure of the computer is totally hidden, it's obscure from him. He is not interested in the detailed implementation of the computer. However, he is interested how fast the computer can execute his application. He is interested in execution speed, the storage capacity and the functionality of the peripheral devices. What different peripheral devices could be connected? Could he use a USB port or not? As a user, he would like, one would like to have as fast a computer as possible and as much memory as could be made available. Now, after looking at the user's view, let us now see the next view how a programmer 
views the computer. Programmer in our context is a person who programs either in machine language or in assembly language. Machine language is the native language of a computer. Whatever is the eventual language used by the programmer, computer is going to store and process data in the form of bits and bytes and the storage is in the form of ones and zeros. In early days, the machine language programming was possible and it was done, but it is really tedious to program in machine language. The programmer to facilitate the job changed over to assembly language. The assembly language programming is basically an English-like language indicating the instructions or commands executed by the computer. Let us look at some features of the assembly language programming. Assembly language commands are a symbolic representation of machine language command using English-like keywords called mnemonics. Using assembly language commands, it's much easier to program than as compared to machine language in the form of long strings of ones and zeros. The commands in assembly language have a one-to-one -one correspondence with machine language commands. However, there are a few exceptions. The exceptions could be that where we have a jump. You have learnt details of assembly language programming in an earlier course. Just to illustrate one example, just please have a look at this slide where an example from the Intel x86 family of computers is illustrated. In the first column, the instructions are given in assembly language. Second column indicates the machine language equivalent in the form of binary ones and zeros. To write it in a short form, the third column illustrates the hex notation. And the last and fourth column indicates what type of instruction is being executed. For example, in the first row, it's an add instruction where the contents of registers dx and cx are added and the result is stored in register cx. This is an example of arithmetic instruction. Similarly, the second example, the move instruction, is a data transfer instruction. The third row indicates an example of a logic operation. And finally, the last row indicates a control instruction in the form of jump. Here, you may note that alpha is just a label. It does not represent an absolute address and it would depend after execution that where you are going to jump to. Let us now look at some of the features where assembly language program would be used. It appears that it's not easy to program in assembly or in machine language. Nevertheless, assembly language is not dead and it is still very frequently used. The question is, who are the users of assembly language? 
first of all you will appreciate that anybody who has to design a machine that means an architect should very clearly understand how the assembly language could be written what are different assembly language instructions so the first user of assembly language is a machine designer the second user of assembly language is a compiler writer the compiler writer would just convert write a program which would convert higher level language into either directly machine language or first to assembly and then to machine language now if one is writing programs in assembly language then the conversion to machine language could be more efficient nevertheless if a compiler is used to convert a higher level language into a machine language then on one hand a unique code may not be available and secondly this code may not be extremely efficient so therefore the compiler writer needs to appreciate and understand the different features of an assembly language programming third user of assembly language could be a writer of the time and space critical code there are some real time applications where the time is critical and the operations need to follow a particular sequence in that case also one needs to understand the assembly language very clearly finally the current applications are in embedded systems one example of the embedded system is a normal mobile phone a mobile phone has a cpu a processor and it has a complete code to do all the functions now an assembly language uh, programmer can very efficiently program in an embedded environment now for appropriate programming an assembly language programmer would need certain tools and let us now have a look at these set of tools and how these would be utilized by the programmer the useful tools for assembly language programmers are the assembler the linker the debugger or monitor and other parts of a development system now in an earlier course you have learned in detail what an assembler is just to review assembler is a program written for converting the assembly language program into its equivalent machine language program using a computer program this computer program is called an assembler and the process of conversion is called the assembly process the assembly process can also be done by hand without using a computer however it is tedious and error prone an assembler that runs on one processor and translates an assembly language program of another machine language is called a cross assembler it is an appropriate tool sometimes when we do not have approach to a specific processor we can just run a cross assembler using an other processor the linker just gives us a possibility of dividing a big program into sub modules when developing large programs separate modules can be developed and assembled by different persons working at the same time the linker links 
these different modules together to form a single module for loading and execution. A linker resolves cross-references and determines the starting point for execution of the program. The debugger is another program which is pretty handy. Working in assembly language is tedious and error prone. When we run a, an assembler, the syntax errors could be eliminated or we could point out to the syntax error while running an assembler. However, runtime errors often crash the system instead of smoothly returning the user to the operating system. A debugger, which is sometimes also called a monitor, is a computer program used to help in finding the errors, logical errors in the program. Useful functions which are available with most of the debuggers include display and alter the contents of memory and CPU registers and flags. That means if during runtime of a particular program written in assembly, one finds that contents of a particular register needs to be changed. These could be changed by using a debugger instead of writing and running the assembler again. Disassembly or reverse assembly of machine code is possible by using a debugger. Finally, an extremely useful facility in the debugger is to have breakpoints. By putting up breakpoints, one could stop the program at any point of time and view the contents of memory and different registers. This could also be implemented in the form of single stepping. That means one instruction at a time is executed. Development tools is a set of hardware and software tools available to the programmer for appropriate development and debug debugging of the program. For assembly language program, the tools available are, we could have efficient tools for development. Some of these tools constitute hardware and others constitute software. The software tools available to the programmer are assembler, compiler, debugger. Whereas the hardware tools are emulators and the logic analyzers. Now another tool which is a simulator is normally implemented in the form of software. All these tools uh, enable a programmer in assembly language to develop an assembly language program in an efficient manner and without bugs. Let us look at some of the differences between higher level language programming and assembly language programming. In general, there is a many-to-many -many mapping between higher level language and equivalent assembly language constructs. This means that if a higher level language program is written, that would not always necessarily correspond to a unique assembly language program. In higher level language, the type checking is provided. This means that proper verification of the type of variables is available at compile time. The compiler also allows to determine the requirements for the memory. A compiler 
also helps to detect bad programming practices. Most of the machines have no type checking. This means that in assembly language, the type checking would not be done. The machine would look only data and instructions as a string of bits. The instructions are interpreted as type usually limited to either a signed or an unsigned integer or it could be considered as a floating point number. A given 32-bit word, for example, in an instruction could be considered as an integer or a floating point number or it could be considered as four ASCII characters. Most of the earlier computers and the present day computers operate on the concept of stored program. The program along with the data is stored in the memory of the computer. This could be fetched from a hard disk, for example, placed in the memory of the computer and then executed. An instruction is fetched from the memory. It is decoded and executed. This process of fetching and execution go instruction by instruction, one after the other, unless a jump instruction is encountered. An instruction register in the CPU is the register which holds the current instruction being executed. After this instruction is executed, the program counter, which is another register, which holds the address of the next instruction to be fetched from the memory that is updated. Unless there is a jump, the next instruction would be the instruction in the queue available in the memory. This process of fetch and execute would continue unless we meet a jump in the program. This is a very simple and a very important concept which is based, which is implemented in the execution of a program in the computer. This is an oversimplified picture. The present day computers, they have the facility of executing multiple instructions simultaneously. We will look into these features in uh, a later lecture and then we will consider also the concept of pipelining. At this moment, to summarize, we could say that the execution goes by fetching the instructions from the memory, decoding the instructions, executing the instructions, updating the contents of the program counter which would contain or point the next instruction to be executed. This idea of fetch and execute could be illustrated by a simple animation. Let us look at this animation. Looking at the animation, on the left hand side, the various registers of the CPU are indicated. In this example, all these registers are 16-bit registers. PC is the program counter. IR is the instruction register. On the right side, we have the addressable memory, in this case from 0, 0, 0, 0 to FFFF. The control unit just coordinates different activities. The contents of the program counter are to start with 
3 f f f and this program counter contents are given on the address bus the data from the given address in pc is fetched in this case this data would be delivered and stored in the instruction register ir and cpu reading this data in ir would would, would decode this instruction and execute after decoding the contents of the program counter would be upgraded to 4002 that means the last instruction executed had a length of 3 words so therefore the pc is having the contents 4002 which is 3 added to the previous contents in case of a branch instruction the contents of the pc are replaced by the address of the next instruction contained in the present branch instruction and the current status of the processor is stored in a register called the processor status register it is also called flag register to summarize the entire process of reading memory incrementing the pc and decoding the instruction is known as the fetch and execute principle of the stored program computer as i have already said that most of the present day computers still utilize the fetch and execute principle however the advanced features have also been incorporated like pipelining which we will discuss in a later lecture after looking into the stored program concept let us look at the instruction set architecture this is an extremely important programming model for an assembly language programmer the set of instructions available for a given processor along with the memory space and the registers available to the programmer in cpu are the resources which are to be utilized by the assembly language programmer and this is defined as isa instruction set architecture let us look at isa in a little bit more detail in the following slide isa stands for instruction set architecture and it could be viewed as a model for the computer it includes the instruction set memory space and all the map programmer accessible registers one should note that the total memory space is not necessarily the physical memory of the processor usually this is the maximum addressable memory which is available to the programmer the physical memory is usually less than this particular maximum addressable space this isa model serves as an interface between the program and the functional units of the computer after looking at programmer's view let us come to the view of a computer architect as we know computer architect has to design a, an overall computer system he has to optimize different subsystems before he can optimize he has to determine which parameters are to be optimized the given 
circumstances could be just for least cost that could be a parameter or maximum performance minimum execution time simple instruction set different features are to be looked into however one thing is quite clear that a computer architect has to provide an instruction set architecture which could be later used for a for programming purposes by a programmer let us look into some of the available tools and the features which are to be provided by a computer architect let us see that on the next slide a computer architect is concerned with design and performance of the entire system he would design an efficient isa for programming and to provide optimum performance of implementation a computer architect would design the hardware for best implementation of the instructions the computer architect would use performance measurement tools some of the benchmark programs to see whether the goals are met or not an architect has to balance the performance of different building blocks such as cpu memory io devices and the interconnections he needs to meet the performance goals at the lowest cost some of the useful tools available to the computer architect are software models simulators and emulators performance benchmark programs specialized measurement programs data flow and bottleneck analysis subsystem balance analysis different parts manufacturing and testing cost analysis finally we look at the perception of a logic designer the logic designer works at gate level he has to work very closely with a computer architect let us look at the next slide in more detail what is the perception of a logic designer a logic designer designs the machine at the logic gate level he determines whether the architect meets the cost and performance goals a single person or a single team may be performing both the jobs of a computer architect and a logic designer the tools available to the logic designers are usually the cad tools consisting of logic design and simulation packages printed circuit layout tools integrated circuit design and layout tools logic analyzers and oscilloscopes hardware development system the logic designer analyzer needs to know the implementation domain the implementation domain is the collection of hardware devices with which the logic designer works examples of the implementation domain could be ttl gallium arsenide chips plas and vlsi on silicon some examples are shown in the next slide in this slide you see the implementation of a 2 to 1 multiplexer in generic form with a select you could get either of the two inputs transmitted to the output we could also 
show this 2 to 1 multiplexer in a different implementation. This is the TTL implementation where the inputs are given to different pin numbers of the IC shown with a 74 series. In the next implementation, the same 2 to 1 multiplexer is shown in fiber optics directional coupler switch. The classical logic design usually deals with the state diagram. It implements the sequential logic considering the machine as a finite state machine. However, the traditional techniques used in logic design could not be efficiently used for design of computers. In today's lecture, we have got an introduction to the outline of the course. We discussed the distinction between computer organization and computer architecture. We looked into the perception of different people about computers. We looked into the stored program concept and fetch execute cycle. Finally, we saw the instruction set architecture. Next time, we are going to look into the classification of different architectures of computers. I hope through today's lecture you have become familiar with the terminology and now you know who is a computer architect. In the next lecture, we are going to talk in more detail about the architectural features of the computer. For today, Khuda Hafiz.